Hey kids, it's Mr and Fly here, hope you're well, and welcome back to another bike news. This time, it's for the month of July 2023. Okay, so welcome back to the channel and another edition of Bike News. I've got uh, five papers to go through this month, so quite a lot, quite a lot's been going on. You might want to grab a brew for this one, because I think it might be a bit of a long edition. Right, let's crack on. Okay, first story, first paper. Coming soon, ZX4RR. Now, I'm pretty sure we've mentioned this before on the channel. This is the new uh, small four-cylinder screamer from Kawasaki. I'm very excited about this uh, bike. I just think uh, uh, four-cylinder bikes like this are what I've been missing from the market for a very, very long time. So uh, Kawasaki have said they are now bringing this to the UK, which is brilliant, brilliant news. And as Kawasaki UK now talk to me, they didn't used to, but they do now, I'm really hoping I'm gonna get my hands on one of these quite soon. Let's see what it says here in MCN about it. Anyway, Kawasaki have teased more details of their hotly anticipated ZX4R sports bike, confirming that only the RR version will be coming to the UK, and it will be a competitive 8,699. So just under nine grand, which sounds quite good, doesn't it? But it is only a 400cc bike, but uh, nonetheless, I think that's good value. It says here it'll be available from September September, so not very long to wait. I have noticed on some other YouTube channels uh, based over in the US that they're already reviewing the bike, so it's already out there, but we're getting it in September apparently. Uh, the bike reignites an extinct four-cylinder 400 class. Uh, the incoming RR will be powered by a 399cc double overhead cam four-cylinder engine producing a claimed 78.9 brake horsepower at 14,500 RPM. That is going to sound epic, isn't it? It's going to be great fun on the road. You can thrash the pants off it and you're not going to be doing stupid speeds. It's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Being the RR version, the bike gets a quick shifter and auto blipper, plus traction control uh, to keep everything pointing in the right direction. How cool is that? LCD dash, 37mm upside down shower, big piston, separate function forks with preload adjustability. It's got all the bells and whistles, even though it's a 400cc bike. I love the sound of this. And it's got a relatively accessible 800mm seat height, so everybody should be able to fit on it. Well, within reason, it's not too tall anyway, as sports bikes often can be. But yeah, I cannot wait to have a go on this, see how this sounds. Uh, I'm not sure the looks are completely to my taste, but I'll put that aside. I mean, it is a sports bike. All sports bikes look good, really, don't they? I think so, anyway. Um, but yeah, I cannot wait to get a go on that. Let me know uh, if you're as excited about the ZX4RR as I am. Okay, next up, a bike I'm not <laughs> excited about. Himalayan 450 elevates range. Spy shot show big capacity single in development. So this is the Royal Enfield Himalayan, or Himalayan, as it's pro properly pronounced. Apparently there's a 450cc version coming. Now I have to say, I know this bike has some massive fans out there in the real world, uh, and it's certainly built for a purpose, and it does that thing very well. It's rugged, it's great for doing, you know, off-road, outback type touring. But for me, it just looks a dog. And when I rode the original, uh, I didn't much like it, I have to say. Well, it's just not for me, let's put it that way. Let's see what it says about this one anyway. A larger capacity 450 version of Royal Enfield's Himalayan could be right around the corner with fresh spy shots showing what appears to be a near production ready machine out on the road. Uh, liquid cooled single is a first for Enfield and like to produce it in the region of 40 brake horsepower. Uh, it's, it's a step up from the existing Himalayan 411 which puts out 24 brake horsepower. So yeah, useful increase in power, and that probably was my main, uh, my main, my main dislike about the um, about the bike was that it was just a little bit gutless. Uh, not to mention I don't like the looks either, but definitely a good increase from 24 brake horsepower to 40 brake horsepower. Uh, we could see the finished bike revealed at the end of September, and it's likely to sit alongside the current model rather than replace it entirely. Interesting. We shall see. So there we go. Are you excited about the Himalayan 450? I'm not particularly. Um, I'll have a go on one when it comes around, but uh, for me, it just it just looks horrible. Um, but it's complete, you know, these things are rock solid, rugged and reliable. I, I get why they make them, and I'm sure they sell well uh, in the markets that they're intended for or will sell well, I should say. Right, Rising Stars, here we go. Talking of bikes that I don't like the look of, here's another couple of bikes that I don't particularly like the looks of, at least in the pictures, but they could grow on me in the flesh. I've yet to ride either of these, but uh, I'm hoping to ride both of them in the coming months. So Rising Stars is the headline here. Honda and Suzuki have come up trumps with two affordable adventurers, but which shines brightest on the MCN 250. So this is a head-to-head -head of the new Honda XL 750 Transalp versus the Suzuki V-Strom 800 DE. Uh, out of the two on the looks front, 
what does it for me with the Suzuki is that sort of double stacked LED light. I just don't like the look of that at all. Uh, if it had a more conventional front end or just a single light, I think it would probably be quite a handsome bike. It's ridiculous that just something like that can put me off a bike, isn't it? But there we go. That is the truth for me. The Trans Alp, I think, actually looks quite clean. Uh, I'm really looking forward to riding that because I think that's going to be a great bike. Uh, and at 9,499, a whole grand cheaper than the uh, V-Strom 800, uh, I think is excellent, excellent value. Let's see what... Um, MCN said in their verdict. It's a close run result, says Neavesy. Uh, not only is Honda's new Trans Alp cheaper than the Suzuki, it's the more refined and easier to ride on the road, he says. Uh, it wins our test, but the Suzuki runs it close. It has more bullish character with an engine that's more willing at low RPM. Despite the Trans Alp taking the honours, they both punch well above their weight. And uh, I must say, I mean, these days, there's no such thing as a bad bike out there, is there really? Well, with a few notable exceptions but generally speaking they're all pretty good they've given the suzuki v-strom 800 four out of five and the trans alp uh five out of five uh, i think i mentioned i am getting a trans alp soon for a, a couple of weeks so i should get to know that little bike and i cannot wait to do that because uh, i'm only hearing good things about it so even though the looks being a bit sort of upright and dakar-esque aren't really to my taste it could be one of those bikes that grows on me when i when i ride on it um the suzuki Actually, looking at it from this angle, um, looks a little bit better, but uh, we shall see in the flesh, it might look much better. So I should reserve judgment before casting nasturtions, <laughs> aspersions, uh, on, on the looks of the bike, shouldn't I really? But there we go. The thing, the fact is, looks of bikes mean everything, don't they? When you're, when you're buying, you buy with your heart, not with your head, don't you? And if the bike doesn't look right, then you're unlikely to buy it. Uh, and of course, everybody's tastes differ. So thank goodness, so we don't all like the same things, of course. So talking of uh, looks on bikes being important, look at this. Bags of value from Honda, new 10,449 CMX 1100T Rebel offers an alternative take on the bagger genre. Now the Rebel series of bikes from Honda, although they're very popular, I have to say, I just I don't like the looks of them at all. The way the, the fuel tank sits on top of the frame, it doesn't do it for me. And similarly, I don't like um, bagger style bikes that have bat wing fairings. So why is it then, in this case, I actually quite like the look of this. I think this little mini back wing that the new um, Rebel CMX 1100T has actually improves the look of the bike. Uh, and for me, that looks pretty good. So uh, yeah, I'm surprised, I'm, I'm shocking myself by saying this, but that looks good to me. Um, it looks quite a cool bike and with the bagger boxes on the back as well, probably quite practical. Uh, an amazing value, at less than 11 grand when compared to say Harleys, for example. So let's see what uh, Chris Newbigging says uh, in his verdict. The simple addition of luggage and screen is the making of the Rebel and I completely agree just by looking at it. It becomes a great tool for medium length trips. It's amazing value too. Harley's cheapest bike is still over 3,000 more than the Honda. Okay, now I get Harleys, um, and uh, is is the Harley worth a three thousand premium over the Honda? Well, on paper, probably not. But in reality, if you're going to buy one of these sort of bikes, I suspect I would still go for the Harley. Of course, not everybody's as fortunate as I, and uh, you know, cost. Uh, you know, is a, is a big factor, of course, when you come to purchase bikes. If you can't stretch that extra three grand, then this looks like it would make a really handsome alternative. I like the fact that on the Batwing fairing, they've got a little screen as well tucked in there. It looks really quite good. I must uh, have a word with my friends at Honda uh, and see if I can get hold of one of these as soon as they're available. I think that uh, that really has improved the looks of the Rebel, I think. Fascinating to hear your views on that. Did you like the look of the Rebels it stood? And do you think that actually Batwing fairings generally, do you like them? And what do you think of this one? I think uh, yeah, it looks a cracker. Right, moving on. Right, second newspaper of this month. And I must say, apologies to MCN uh, for last month when I said that I hadn't received one of their papers. It turns out I had received it. It's just my daughter had squirreled it away somewhere and I didn't realise. So uh, that's the paper we just covered. All right, moving on then to the more recent ones. First story here, Trance Small Wonders Arrive. Now these are the A2 license friendly Speed 400 and the Scrambler 400X, the single CC bikes that have uh, had uh, caused a real stir because I think they look absolutely amazing. There's more about these uh, a little bit later because MCN have actually ridden a pre-production version of these now but uh, yeah so these were launched in the last month or certainly uh, you know it's the first that we saw them officially wasn't it uh, they look absolutely amazing to me and if they get the price right uh, i don't think we know the prices yet uh, they're going to be absolutely brilliant uh, they need to be pitched though don't they squarely at things like the royal enfield interceptor uh, that sort of price uh, even though it's a 400 i mean the triumph build quality looks great on it and let, before i get too enthusiastic let me talk to you about what it says here in mcn so meet the triumph speed 400 and scrambler 400x uh, powered by a new liquid cooled 398 cc single and built in collaboration with indian manufacturing giants bajaj auto 
The sub 47 brake horsepower singles class is big business globally and that of course is what Triumph want to tap into with this and I think they stand a great chance of doing so too. Triumph understandably fancy a slice of that cake um, with both new bikes producing a claimed 39.5 brake horsepower at 8,000 RPM available from December 2023 but no word on pricing yet. Both the Speed and the Scrambler were created and designed in Hinkley with the production carried out by Bajaj in India as well as in Triumph's own Indian and Thai plants. I didn't know that uh, Triumph had its own plants in India so we have something I've learnt. Said to be characterful and paired with a distinctive single cylinder engine note has a seat height of 790mm, nice and low so everybody can get on it pretty much. Uh, the Speed 400 will be available in the choice of Carnival Red, Caspian Blue and Phantom Black uh, and I have to say looks lovely, can't wait to have a go at this either. Um, I hope the, the single's not too thumpy because I'm sure Triumph have done a good job at balancing this out, I don't know. Uh, let's have a look at the Scrambler then. It says here the new 400X gets different electronics package and suspension setup designed to help it feel more at home off the beaten track. This could be a real contender, I think, for off-road bit of green laning because it's going to be nice and light. Tipping the scales at 179 kilograms, uh, actually nine kilos more than the Speed 400. That's interesting. There's a taller 835 mil seat height. This is pretty tall. Uh, might, might count me out, actually, because I'm only a shorty. Uh, uh, plus, there's a 19-inch front wheel for better off-road prowess. I see why it's taller. The forks have an additional 10 mil of travel with an extra 20 mil at the rear plus a slightly wider set of bars. Uh, the front brakes are also different. Interesting. Uh, looks cool though again, uh, and well, I cannot wait to get my hands on this. I think there's a story later on when MCN have ridden, uh, as I say, a pre-production version of this. But uh, yeah, what a breath of fresh air. Um, th these, we need more of these sort of bikes. I think these are going to fly off the shelves here in the UK as well as abroad. I really do. Oh, big story, R13GS confirmed now. We all know that the new BMW GS has been around the corner, in fact, in several flavours, don't we? We've known for at least a year when they had that little leak on their dealer site about the maintenance of them. So we know there's going to be a 1300GS and a 1400GS as well, replacing, likely replacing the Adventure. But anyway, BMW have now confirmed the official re reveal date will be Thursday, September the 28th. So we're going to learn all we need to know about the new bikes then. This is probably the most hotly anticipated bike, certainly for viewers of my channel, that I can remember. So... I'm so hoping that BMW uh, will see good to lend me one of these as soon as they're available on the press fleet. I've asked them if I can have one long term, by which I mean proper long term, you know, up to a year to really assess the new bike. This potentially is the bike that would make me replace my GS and I cannot wait to bring the details of it to you if I get the chance. So fingers crossed uh, BMW are going to help me out with that. So uh, yeah, if you want to give them a nod and ask them to lend me one that would be brilliant but uh, as soon as I know more about this I'll let you know stay tuned to the channel but 28th of September is when it's all happening we'll learn more about it then I so hope they haven't messed up the looks of the bike but uh, it's such an important bike for BMW I can't imagine they have but we'll see all right next Norton affordable Norton's on the way now this is a bit of a change of heart isn't it uh, because if you remember in the past Norton have always said that they wanted to be or at least this is what I thought they always wanted to be a boutique brand and so far they've made expensive uh, motorcycles of course I recently rode the Commando uh, which is a fairly basic bike but still uh, priced quite expensively and I wasn't that impressed with it to be fair go and check out my review of that if you've not seen it um, but the the big V4s are very expensive um, but they're now saying they may, that there are smaller bikes on the way. So let me read what it says and then, then we'll have a think about it. So following the launch of the 41,999 V4 CR Cafe Racer at the Bike Shed Show in London, Norton CEO Dr. Robert Henschel has told MCN that more affordable models are not too far away. This is brilliant news. I think this is what could make Norton really great. Henschel claims Norton will start to show some new products by the end of 2024 with a view to releasing more affordable machinery alongside the luxury four-cylinder bikes we've already seen. This would be fantastic. If they get these right, I would love to have a Norton in my garage. And if they're making affordable, maybe smaller bikes, less boutique uh, at the end of next year then put me down for one is what I'm saying. Even though I wasn't, as I say, a massive fan of the um, Commando. Anyway, carry on. We have to find the right product mix, and if you want to build some volume, you also need to be competitive in the base models to offer the whole customer range. I could not agree more with Dr. Robert Henschel, who, by the way, I'm hoping I might be meeting in the next few months. It may not happen yet. There's a, it's all a little bit up in the air, so maybe I shouldn't even mention this, but following the review I did of the... Um, Commando, uh, Norton have reached out to me, as they say, across the pond, uh, and asked if I want to have a factory tour, uh, a personal factory tour, actually looking around how they're building these things. Hopefully it'll be a chance for me, for them to address some of those comments I made in that previous video, and also potentially meet Dr. Henschel as well. And I'll, uh, if I do do that, I shall definitely be talking about 
what those new models are going to be. So if you've got any questions or anything like that that you'd like me to put to them, uh, do put them in the comments below because when I get around to doing that uh, video, if and when, uh, then I'll put your questions to them as well. It'd be great to uh, to be able to do that. So do do that. And, I'm, and I, I think it's a great move by Norton. When I made that video and I was quite critical of the bikes, I thought this is it, Norton are probably never going to let me borrow a bike again. But I think for them, it's exactly the right thing to do. This is PR as it should be, hopefully they're going to address the concerns that I raised in those in those videos. So uh, so that's brilliant. So well done, Norton. Uh, let's see what these newer, more affordable bikes are going to get uh, come and, and give us. I cannot wait to see those. So that's all good news. Right, next up, meet the world's craziest Grom. Uh, turbo slash nitrous minibike ready to storm wheels and waves. Now the wheels and waves thing is held down in Biarritz in France. Uh, and this is an entry for that made by Guy Willison or uh, Skid from Henry Cole's The Motorbike Show. Uh, and he's also the guy that does the joint ventures with Honda. Do you remember he did that, uh, the Honda, um, fuck, I can't remember what it's called, the 754, beautiful version uh, of the four cylinder bike. Uh, anyway, let's get on to the Grom. So it says here, Guy Willison has gone off the scale with this turbo slash nitrous build with a paint job from Matt B, whose day job is apparently painting trainers for the rich and famous. Who even knew such a day job existed? Uh, when I got the Grom, this is, uh, this is Guy talking, uh, I've got to make it outrageous, Willison told MCN. A lot of people make them look like mini Africa twins, and I nearly went down that route. Uh, but then I happened to see a Japanese build of a drag looking bike. I saw the stance on a new, I had that fairing on the shelf, and I thought it would look fantastic. And in fact, if you haven't seen Guy Willison's YouTube channel, go and check him out because you can see him actually building this bike on there. I'm not sure when Wheels and Waves is, it might have already happened. I know that last year he made an entry for Honda, uh, and I think they came second. And it really annoyed Guy that he came second because he thought he should have won. So he's having another crack at it with this outrageous nitrous fuel drag bike out of a Grom. It's just hilarious. I'd love to see and hear it go. Um, and uh, wish him the best of luck with winning uh, the class at this, this year's Wheels and Waves. I'm sure we'll find out in due course. All right, that's it for the second paper. All righty, first story here, Triumph for the Masses. Hinkley bosses hint at more to come from the new Bajaj Autotype. So we just talked about the new bikes that we know are coming, the Scrambler and the Little 400, but they're saying there's more. Let me read you what it says here. Triumph bosses have hinted at more small capacity models to come following the launch of their A2 friendly Speed 400 and Scrambler 400X that we just talked about. Designed in Hinkley, they will be built by Bajaj for the Indian market and by Triumph in Thailand and Brazil for the rest of the world. So again, who knew? I'm learning all sorts. So they've also got they've got factories in India and Brazil that I didn't know about, as well as Thailand. Trump's chief commercial officer, Paul Stroud, told MCN, as you know, we're looking at many ways to grow our business. Uh, the range starts today at just under 8,000. And there are a lot of people just starting out in biking for whom that's unobtainable. Absolutely right. And, and again, I just can't see these, these smaller capacity Triumphs failing. If the build quality is as good as the Triumphs we've seen in the last four or five years, then these are going to be amazing. Again, if they get the pricing right as well. Uh, so I can't see what I can't wait to see what else they're going to come up with. Uh, maybe, I don't know, something a bit more, well, I don't know. If they're doing a Scrambler and they're doing sort of a retro roadster, what other genres could there be? Maybe a little cruiser? I don't. I personally don't think that small engine suit cruisers, so I wouldn't be that excited about that personally. Like a mini Speedmaster or something wouldn't be for me. But uh, yeah, fascinating to see what else they come up with on that small. Maybe a little adventure bike based on it. A little off-road or adventure type bike would be fantastic. All good news from Triumph. This is great. Right, this is a wacky story. I love wacky types of uh, people that do this sort of thing. Fantastic. Full steam ahead here is the uh, is the headline. Speed freak grandfather obliterates speed record with steam powered with a steam powered special. Who knew there was even a steam powered class for speed records? Here we go. This is a Yorkshire grandfather called Graham Sykes. He's 60 years old. Not that matters. That's young. Uh, he has smashed the world land speed record for a steam powered motorcycle, uh, reaching 163 miles an hour in just 3.8 seconds over the eighth of a mile. 163 using. Steam Steam. Now, what the interesting of this is, he's not using steam to turn a turbine to turn the engine. He's actually using it to chuck out the back a bit like a rocket, as far as I can tell. It's sort of a ballistic-y type thing. Anyway, let me read on. Uh, force of nature is thrust driven using the latent energy of superheated pressurized water that is then released through the nozz nozzles, a process which is both lengthy and technical. This is much more high tech than it sounds. The bike docks onto what we call a mothership, Graham said, which is basically a utility trolley where there's a firebox. The flame generates around about 800 degrees centigrade of hot gas. We take about four hours to heat it up to 250C. This isn't a bite you're going to be nipping down the shops for some eggs on. Uh, and it brings the internal pressure of the vessel up to 40 bar, which is around 600 PSI. You can imagine that. Uh, and at that point, you've got lots of potential energy in the temperature of the water. 
A bike that uh, apparently this uh, the bike produces a sonic boom before it gets going as the steam is released through a specialist valve at a velocity greater than the speed of sound. What a nuts machine, I love it. Before Graham's creation, the steam-powered motorcycle record stood at just 80.5 miles an hour, set back in 2014, so Graham has absolutely smashed this with his 163. Uh, more than doubled it, brilliant, brilliant story. Well done, Graham. And what a technical marvel as well. Presumably that previous bike was a proper steam, well, not proper, this isn't not proper, if you see what I mean, but was probably using steam to drive the wheel like a steam train would, but this one, as I say, from what I can gather, is using it more like, you know, uh, an equal and opposite reaction type thing. It's a, it's a thrust bike as opposed to turning the wheel with steam. But hopefully you know what I'm talking about. Right, that, great story. Love that. Well done, Graham. Uh, brilliant, brilliant story. Next up, little on large. Don't let your height stand in the way of the bike you want. This is something that's uh, close to my heart. We test two big bikes built to make life easier for the vertically challenged. I count myself in that category. I'm five for eight and some of these adventure bikes can be a bit tall. And this is also doubly interesting because what they've done here is they, they've pitted the Multistrada V4 Rally against the Harley Davidson Pan America. I say it's interesting for me because I've got the Pan America in the garage at the moment and they have been using the self-lowering system on it. Now on the Ducati, it, uh, it too, with the software upgrade, allows you to lower and um, raise the height on it by pressing a button when you come to a stop it'll lower wind off the preload and you can get your feet down easier great idea on the harley though it does it automatically and i've been riding this bike a fair bit over the last week or so and it always gets it right it always lowers when you come to a halt i felt completely planted on it the looks of the bike that's another thing wait for my review of the bike which will be coming out i think in september sorry for the wait uh, when i tell you more about the bike in general so i'm not saying it's a lovely looking bike or anything like that i get all that it splits opinions but the lowering and raising thing absolutely brilliant works a treat what do mcn say about it a big deal for small riders uh the real winner here is smaller riders never before have bikes this big been so manageable no matter our inside leg measurement the harley davidson is a little kinder to short legs but it doesn't quite pack the same comfort or riding experience as the ducati that's true the multi-strider is an amazing bike to ride actually and the harley davidson is not bad i have to say i was surprised by it most importantly though, both bikes offer the one thing we all look for as riders and that's confidence and for us shorties, that's what matters the most, absolutely. With all these sorts of things that involve, you know, a bit of, a bit of skill, confidence is all, isn't it? If you think you can do something, you, you know, you stand a better chance of doing it. If you think you can't, you're probably right and you probably can't. Uh, so yeah, the fact that the, these bikes are now giving us the opportunity to lower them a little bit, I think is just brilliant. So, uh, you know, sometimes I criticise technology on bikes, but when it does something so practical like this or it's safety related and I'm kind of class this as safety related as well then i think it's a great thing so well done those manufacturers let's hope more manufacturers do. wouldn't it be amazing if the new gs did something like that and especially if it did it automatically like the harley davidson that would be a game changer not that the gs needs any help being sold because of course it's a very very popular bike anyway but uh, that's something i would love to see on the new gs let's hope it's there eh? right Last story in this paper, Naked Aggression just got affordable. At 6999 the new CF Moto 800 NK Sport really means business, but does it deliver the goods? Now, I think this looks really, really nice. Now, again, sometimes I criticise, like I did that Suzuki earlier, that, you know, lights on modern bikes look a bit wrong. But this one, they've gone for a modern-looking light look. It looks almost like an alien's face, but... But it looks good here on the CF Moto. The downside with it, even though I love the looks of the bike and the price sounds great, it's just CF Moto is an unknown quantity, isn't it? I just I don't think I've ever seen one on the road. I've certainly never ridden one, um, and I, so I'm not. I can't judge whether it's a good bike or not. But uh, I think they're Chinese made, which puts a little rings little alarm bells in my head. Um, but we shouldn't poo poo them, and I, I think it looks lovely. I mean, if this had Honda or Yamaha written on the side, or indeed Triumph, I would be chomping at the bit to ride this. It looks great, so I, I would actually quite fancy go if anyone at CF Moto is watching. Uh, it looks brilliant, and. Uh, Anyway, let's see. Let's see what it says here. With the might of the Piera, Piera, P-I-E-R-E-R, Piera. Let's call it Piera Moto Mobility Group, the parent company of KTM, which in itself gives it some credibility, doesn't it? Uh, behind them, CF Moto have big ambitions for the future. Their aim is to be a Chinese brand offering not only small bikes with even smaller price tags, but to become a mainstream name offering quality, exciting machinery of every capacity. Well, that's a laudable thing to do, isn't it? Uh, the 799cc parallel twin is the same unit as used in the original KTM 790 Duke. Now, even if this had KTM stamped on the side, even though it's made in the same Chinese factory, presumably, you know, I'll be going for it. 
isn't that bizarre how we get you know, those kind of things in our head? Anyway, uh, it does make it, it claims a 93 brake horsepower um, and 58.2 pound, foot pounds of torque. So just in that sweet spot for a road bike, I think at 93 brake horsepower, it's going to go nice. Um, so to put that into perspective, it packs more power and more torque than the class leading Suzuki GSX-8S and Honda's CB750 Hornet, both great bikes. So uh, yeah, it's in that sort of class and I think it looks better than both those bikes as well. Such a shame though, we're gonna think of it as a Chinese bike. The handling is super sharp, at 186 kilograms with a reasonably short wheelbase. It's flickable like a supermoto. Uh, let's see what the verdict was from uh, Carl Stevens. Forget where it's built, it's hard to do that. And we need to see some long-term tests to see how the, you know, what the longevity of these is and what the reliability is. Where are your dealers? Where are you going to get the thing serviced? All that is kind of important, isn't it? Anyway, uh, so forget where it's built. He says the 800 NK Sport is a lot of bike for the money. I agree with that. But the seat is uncomfortable, the riding position compact, and the switch gear is clumsy. Oh, suddenly it's <laughs> sounding less attractive. Uh, Honda's incredibly priced Hornet, which comes with the heritage of a Honda Badge 2, costs the same. So there we go. Yeah, would you buy this over a Hornet, I guess, is the question. Uh, would I do that? Reality, well, I haven't, ridden, uh, I haven't ridden this yet. I'd have to ride them both, of course, but on paper, I'd probably go for the Hornet, which was great. Right, that's it for this uh, paper. Uh, two more to go, then we get on to some parish notices. Right, here we go. Hold on tight, it says here. A coal a milliard, eclipse 183 miles an hour for two up speed record. Now, uh, if you watched my video on Wednesday, uh, we talked a bit about this then. Uh, I, I went riding with uh, Alan Miller. In fact, I took Alan flying in the aeroplane. And then we went for a ride on his um, the flying milliard, his bike that he made out of part of a radial engine uh, from, a, from a DC3 Dakota. Absolutely incredible. If you haven't watched that video, I'll put a link in the corner. Alan is a top bloke engineering genius uh, and he has got some marvellous creations this being one of them the viper special and we've got some plans for me to go on the back of this as well not quite sure when it's going to happen some planets need to align uh, but uh, we've been chatting to uh, the country's friendliest airfield that is Tur Western up in I think it's Oxfordshire been talking to Chris up there who manages the airfield and also is a viewer of the channel so hi Chris if you're watching saw him at ABR as well which was great uh, anyway he said that uh, if me and Alan want to go up there and use the runway for me to have a go on the back of this viper bike we're welcome to do so so thank you Chris for that offer thank you alan as well for uh, you know saying that you're up for that we'll make that happen at some point uh, in the next few months and of course i'll bring you a video about it anyway let's talk about what mcn has said here about that record tv favorites henry cole and alan milliard have set a new speed record for two up riding reaching 183.5 miles an hour on milliard's own 8000 cc viper v10 naked bike what a beast it is too uh, i'm on a homemade bike that weighs 600 kilograms with no fairing says uh, alan i've got that to manage and then i've got someone on the back it's like having a top box on the back of your bike full of cement. I think you said uh, Henry's 15 stone. Uh, and Alan himself is like, you know, he's, he's very um, thin, slight chap. Uh, I, I imagine he's, I don't know, 10 and a half stone. Sorry, I forgot that wrong, Alan. Um, so having a 15 stone on the back, that's going to be quite something to add to the already colossal weight of the Viper. The record attempt was shown in full on uh, Monday, July the 10th episode of the Motorbike Show on ITV4. If you missed it or want to watch it again, go over to ITVX online to catch up. Uh, I've watched it. It's well worth watching. Go and have a look at ITVX if you've not already watched it and see... Uh, how they did it. And, it and it's not a straightforward uh, thing either it's uh, it's quite tricky well to break any land speed record but uh, can you imagine 183 miles now with somebody on the back of the bike nuts brilliant stuff great work henry and alan sad story now ace cafe closes early this is a bit of a shame the ace cafe iconic biking location lots of people meet up there or have done there's car meets there and all sorts of stuff unfortunately i think for the ace it's in a part of london which now is going to be hit by that flipping um you less charge so bikes that are you know old and don't meet that won't be able to go there and meet up anyway which has got to be a blow for the ace cafe uh, uh, and of course it's uh, it's in a busy part of central london so it's quite it's not a great ride to get there in my opinion anyway let's see ace cafe closes early antisocial behavior by a small minority forces the london venue, venue into drastic action london's ace cafe will close at six o'clock on friday evenings uh, until september as a preemptive move to prevent a license review which could have shut down the historic venue for months this is terrible isn't it so uh, mark willsmore the man MD says, on that evening of Friday, June the 23rd, the police were all over the place, seized three motorcycles, which he anticipates, but does, 
doesn't know, didn't have um, insurance or something like that. Also, there was a guy who was stopped and arrested in possession of a stolen bike. So this is all stuff that's nothing to do with Ace Cafe, but it threatens their license. Um, the cafe team took to social media and a Facebook post saying, as a consequence of illegal and unacceptable behaviour, the Ace will close on Fridays at six until further notice. Uh, Willsmore said that the inference that one could draw is, and it seems that the police are in danger of drawing is that we're responsible for these people, which is terrible because of course they're not. Um, so the idiots that have gone up there have caused this to happen. Um, I phoned, Willsmore said, I phoned the licensing chat. We had a good conversation with him, simply reminding us of the conditions of our trading license. In light of that conversation, we decided that we wouldn't take the risk and, and, and keep having these meetings basically on a Friday. It was clear to my, my co-directors and I that we must close on Friday. The 6pm closure will remain until September the 1st. What an absolute blow and what a bunch of idiots that have caused this to happen. It's real sad news. This. I wish the Ace Cafe all the best and I hope that uh, they're able to reopen and their license is safe. Um, right letter here hidden cost of extras this is outrageous this one this is a letter from my papers bent here rob williams in south wales he said i've just ordered a new honda cb750 hornet and wanted a few factory accessories such as a heated grips good idea rob uh, especially in wales and a quick shifter when the total came up i noticed there was a discrepancy of 109 pounds in the cost uh, when i queried this i found out it was for fitting i've never been charged extra for fitting factory options before and i wondered if it was now normal practice for manufacturers to charge like this i consider it a rip-off anyone think the same oh, yes i do rob i absolutely think the same i recently bought you might have seen my video on the uh, kawasaki z900 rs i had some factory options fitted on that and the salesman said to me oh i'll get those fitted for you uh, at no charge as if he was doing me a favor unbelievable so it seems like that may well be that that is the usual practice and they and in some cases like mine I did get them fitted for free but it still felt like they were doing me a favor these are factory options yeah you don't if you buy a BMW car you don't ask you know you don't have to pay for the aircon to be fitted because it's an extra deal absolutely crazy so I'm with you uh, Rob it's a shame you didn't mention who the dealer was here because we should name and shame him but I'm assuming it's it's a uh, it's potentially a Honda dealer in South Wales absolutely outrageous has anyone else had that experience do put comments below I'd love to know how widespread this practice is it sounds like a bit of sharp practice to me outrageous but uh, yeah i'm with you rob and i'm glad you wrote the letter in terrible All right next story cats targets the cream suzuki's katana gets another life but can it beat its japanese retro rival so here they pitted the suzuki katana which i rode when it came out a couple of years ago gets the kawasaki z900 rs which i've just bought so we can assume i'm going to be biased here i bought the se version which is a bit more expensive than that one so it it makes things a little bit different against the Honda CB 1000 R, which I rode relatively recently uh, when my Goldwing was in for service. I got one of these as a loan bike, and I really loved it. But I wouldn't really class it as a retro bike so much; more modern take on retro. Anyway, let's see what MCN said. Oh, it's Nevesy, my favourite tester. He says, uh, Z stands out from the bunch. Good man, Nevesy. Uh, these retros are every inch the big cube inline four cylinder universal Japanese motorcycle, but that's no bad thing. The Z900 RS stands out for the bunch. It has the most real world grunt, the plushest ride and styling cues from the 1972 900 Super 4 Z1, uh, and it's top notch. It's the most frugal, has the biggest range, and it's the best value. So looking at the price here, the Honda CB1000R 13299, the Z900 RS 11799, so basically two grand less, and the Katana 12299, so a bit more than the Kawasaki. So just on price alone, I'll go for the Kawasaki. I went for the RS because it had the um, blingy gold wheels, is outrageous, but I was prepared to pay what amounted to two grand more to get those, but also got the Olin's rear shock, I got Brembo brakes, um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful bike. I've ridden 350 miles on it so far. I only got it last week. Uh, that's over three times what I rode my uh, Panigale in a year, which is the bike that I sold in order to buy the Kawasaki. So uh, anyway, we'll talk more about that in parish notices, I'm sure. Anyway, so there we go. Yeah, so uh, Neves is saying the best of the bunch is the Z900 RS. I'm glad to hear that, having just shelled out that amount of cash on it. Heart in the wrong place. This is interesting. Uh, Yamaha's brilliant CB2 motor and Fantic's funky Caballero aren't the perfect match. Do you remember the Fantic Caballero, which I rode ages ago up at Crazy Horse in Barry St. Edmunds, um, got a lot of plaudits. And then we heard that because there was a uh, some sort of joint venture, I seem to remember, with Yamaha, and uh, Caballero, uh, Fantic rather, they were going to be able to use their engines in the bike. So we're all looking forward to the CP2 engine going in, but it sounds like it's not, not worked too well. Let's see. Fantic single cylinder Caballero are everything you'd hope from a Neo Netro Scrambler. Light, easy to ride with personality from a punchy four stroke thumper. And anything powered by Yamaha's 689cc CP2 parallel twin seems to be a winner. Uh, the MT07, the Tracer, the Tenere, and the XSR, XSR have all sold in droves. We expected a corker from this Italian Japanese collaboration, but that's not quite how it turned out. How interesting. 
Scaling up the Fantic formula with the Yamaha engine hasn't been the success we had hoped. Uh, it's not a bad bike, but the Caballero needs to tug on heartstrings to have a hope of grabbing purse strings too. It just doesn't have the personality to do so, unfortunately. 9,699 and uh, Chris Newbigging, thumbs down from him. Interesting. Have you had a chance? I don't know if these are widely available yet. Uh, I wouldn't mind a little go on one of these. I'm going to Crazy Horse, I hope, in the next few months. I've, I've got. I'll, we keep having dates in the dial and then they keep slipping for one reason or other. Usually always my fault, actually. So maybe I'll get a chance to have a go on one of these if they've got a demo in. I don't know. Uh, and see if I agree. But there we go. There we are. That's it. That's, uh, that's it for the fourth paper. Still with me. Last one. Only a couple of uh, stories here to pull out and then we'll get on to parish notices. First story, punching above its weight. So this is where MCN have got their hands on a pre-production version of the Triumph Speed 400 to see how it goes. A uh, few highlights I've pulled out of the article here. MCN is the first publication to experience Triumph's all new Speed 400. We got a chance to run a pre-production version around the Cotswolds last week. The Speed 400 is modern Triumph's first small capacity entry level A2 compliant model. Uh, we know all that. Let's get to the riding. Competitively priced, it says, that although the new model is already rolling into Indian showrooms, Triumph is still to determine a price for the European spec version, destined for UK dealers in January, apparently. But they say it'll be competitively priced with its A2 class rivals, which means it needs to be around the 5,200 mark. Can you imagine buying a Triumph for 5,200 quid? That'd be an absolute winner, wouldn't it? Getting up close, it's hard to believe that the Speed 400 is a bike that's going to cost somewhere in the region of 5,200, so I'm not holding my breath, actually. I hope they do, because then they're on to a winner. But if they pitch this at six and a half or something, maybe it'll blow it. Anyway, the level of fit and finish is on par with the rest of the Triumph range, which, as we know, is brilliant these days. Now, the Speed 400 effortlessly dances through the turns, seemingly no input through the bars whatsoever. It feels planted like a bigger, heavier machine, but it just weighs 170 kilograms. Riding it briskly on B roads is simply a case of winding on and off the throttle uh, and coasting on the linear torque rather than having to frantically thrash it. It's easy to forget that it's just a 398cc single. This all sounds great so far, doesn't it? Uh, the Speed 400 happily cruises at motorway speeds, showing 6,000 RPM in sixth gear at 70 miles an hour. What a winner I think this could be. So MCN clearly love this love the look of this so uh, yeah can't wait to have a crack at that uh, okay last story in this one trouble at the top bmw's benchmark r1250 rs faces some serious competition from the new moto guzzi mandelo and yamaha tracer 9 gt uh, i've yet to ride the moto guzzi it's one of those bikes that i really would like to ride quite difficult for me to get hold of though i'm hoping my friends at wheels motorcycles might let me ride their demo if they've still got one at some point just got to get that scheduled in uh, i'd love to have a go on it because i think it's the sort of bike that appeals to people that watch this channel anyway let's see what the verdict was uh, three top options in fact looking at the star ratings here they've given the bmw 5 They've given the Tracer 5, and they've given the Mandelo 4, which is interesting because I seem to remember when they rode the Mandelo, I think it was Neves who rode it, he loved it. Um, uh, absolutely thought it was great. So the fact they've only given it four stars now is interesting and a little bit disappointing because I, I find sometimes this happens with MCN, uh, and in the past I've bought bikes based on what MCN have said, and then later on they've reeled back and compared it to rivals, and it's somehow not quite so good. So it's a shame that they do that. Anyway, let's see what the... Um, what the verdict was from Jim Moore. Gutsy have done a fantastic job with the V100 Mandelo S, but in this company, it lacks oomph. Uh, in terms of performance, the BMW is the best here. Uh, the fact that the Yamaha comes fully loaded for less than the BMW uh, SE spec and that get, means that Arnold goes to the Tracer, but it's a close run thing. So uh, yeah, the, the, B, the Beam is lovely, isn't it? I don't know why it doesn't sell more. Um, if you don't go off-road on your GS, then that's probably a more practical bike for you. Uh, but there we are. We all end up buying GSs, myself included. Weird, isn't it? All right, that's it for the paper review. So that means it's time for... You got it? Parish notices. A few things to tell you about what's coming on the channel. But before that, I hope you enjoyed the output that I've put out in the last month. There are a few specials that I kind of done that I weren't sure were going to happen when we did bike news last time, so I didn't tell you about them in bike news. So one of them was the Blood Bikers vid uh, with my mate Nigel. Hope you enjoyed that. That was a fascinating day out. And uh, reading the comments on that, it looks like uh, you enjoyed it too. So that's great. I, I really enjoyed doing that. So thank you to uh, Nigel for sorting that out. Uh, the video I did with Alan Milliard, I mentioned it just now, uh, on the Flying Milliard up at White Waltham was fantastic fun. Uh, no thanks to White Waltham, by the way. They weren't particularly helpful in us doing that, but there we go. We'll move swiftly on over that. But uh, it was great to actually have a ride on the bike, and uh, it was really good to give Alan a chance to fly as well. It was uh, fantastic the, looking at the concentration on Alan's face uh, as he had a go at the controls on the, on the aeroplane. But seemed to enjoy it, so that was great fun. And hopefully I'll do some more with Alan as well. Go check out his channel if you haven't seen it. It's brilliant. He doesn't need my help sending viewers and subscribers 
subscribers there who's going to overtake me very soon because it's a super popular channel but um, yeah great stuff so that was good uh, the bike reveal of course uh, I, again I didn't know that I was going to get that this month I was, I was expecting to get the new Z900 uh, in September so that was a bonus that it came early so uh, really glad that you seem to have liked that bike again the uh, that the reveal of that video has gone nuts uh, it's you know it's it's had massive views and loads and loads of comments so thank you for all your kind thoughts and words on that one we'll see how that goes uh, on that one uh, you know over time because I'm not sure I want to keep three retro bikes in the garage um, but I do love the speed twin and I do love my interceptor custom uh, and they all ride very differently so I'm going to give it probably a year of riding all three and then I'll kind of work out if one of them needs to go I don't know which one it's going to be but there are a few other bikes on the market at the moment that are also quite fancy a go on so I might make a little space for for another new bike maybe end of next year uh, and something's going to have to go to to uh, you know provide space and money for that so we'll see anyway so that's great um uh so that's uh, so yeah i've had a great month of making youtube videos i've thoroughly enjoyed it it's just a shame the weather's been absolutely pants isn't it anyway coming up in august we've got a few things to look forward to we've got the um harley davidson breakout uh which is kind of a revisit for me i did ride the the first harley i ever rode was a breakout uh well it's, it's been revised updated got a newer engine in it and stuff like that i've got another video of that coming up soon i love the looks of that bike it's absolutely incredible we've got a video coming up on how i'm getting on with the kawasaki haven't uh, actually made that video yet of course because uh, i need to ride it for a few weeks but i've already as i think i mentioned put 350 miles on it towards its 600 mile break-in so i want to make a video about uh, running in bikes and that sort of thing and also some of the little changes i'm planning on making to the bike or indeed by the time you see the video may have made uh, based on your comments actually from that reveal video so thank you for all the suggestions hints of things like you know what uh, uh, luggage i could put on the bike uh, and think and other bits and pieces as well so there's a video coming up on that um i've got another of my new series of bargain bike reviews coming up and this is a very popular bike that's been requested a lot it's the bmw k1300s a bike that's passed me by in the past haven't ridden it yet so can't say anything about it but uh, superbike factory are going to be providing me with a second hand one of those in the next couple of weeks and i'll be bringing you a video on that uh, Triumph are going to be sending me down a Triumph Speedmaster Chrome. I've always loved the Speedmaster. That's one of those bikes that uh, is kind of on the list, actually, for a, for a future bike purchase, potentially. So I want to give myself a little revisit of the Speedmaster. So they're going to send a Speedmaster Chrome down soon. So going to be riding that, and hopefully videos on that will be coming up in August, if not September. Uh, potentially a Wales bike tour as well, if the, if the weather pay, plays ball. Hopefully taking the Goldwing with Mrs. Fly up to meet a few pals in Wales and uh, do a bit of a tour around there. So that'll be a bit like old times because that was the I don't know if you remember my original gold wing I bought on the back of a tour in Wales uh, and then I've got another video my final ride of the Ducati Monster SP is coming out as well so uh, stay tuned for that and there may be one or two other little extras in there as well things that I don't want to mention yet just in case they don't happen but uh, anyway so thank you as ever for uh, sticking around and staying tuned and watching the videos I do appreciate every single view and I do appreciate all your comments as well I read absolutely every one I try and respond to as many as I possibly can but it's been thousands and thousands this week and it's taken an awful lot of my time so please don't think I don't read your comments and don't be disappointed if I don't actually write a long uh, answer to you but thank you for all your continued support and for and um, keep, keep watching the channel don't forget if you've not subscribed already I'm sure if you've watched this far you probably are a subscriber but thank you for that if you've not done so already hit the subscribe button right it's time for my lunch I'm going to op it got to uh, edit this video this afternoon and uh, yeah look forward to seeing you in the next one until then this has been the Mr. Listen and fly, cheerio.